I work for Collier County, um, and I manage a, a small, it's a small preserve on the crew standards. It's only 367 acres, but for, for me, it's one of our larger ones. We only have about 19 preserves throughout the county, and this is one of our bigger ones, acreage-wise. So, how did Cary Cary Prairie Preserve get its name? <laughs> <laughs> we have a nesting pair of Kara Kara, and we found the nest again this year, so hopefully they'll get some fledglings. But, uh, I think that's the cutest picture. <laughs> I wanted to name it County Line Preserve, because I guess I'm boring, but you can see where it's located on the county line. <gasps> So this is Kara Kara Prairie Preserve. Here's Corpse Crew. Here's Crew. We're completely surrounded by um, district lands. Pepper Ranch Preserve, if we've heard of that, is due west. Everybody uh, in our, well, not, I shouldn't say everybody, but um, there's been a lot of attention given to Pepper Ranch, which is good for me. Because <laughs> then I kind of just do my thing over in little old Kara Kara Prairie Preserve. <laughs> which I, I, lo I love the place. Um, it's, it's 200, about 200 or so acres of pasture, and um, but it's really got a lot of wildlife biodiversity, which you, you would think. So. Um, here it is. So if you're familiar with crew, this is the um, help me out. So, Cypress Dome Trails. It used to be Gate 5, Gate 6 is over here, and then we, Kathleen kind of named my gate five and a half. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody goes in my gate here except me. And so to get to Kara Kara Prairie Preserve, which is open to the public, which I, I call CCP for short, because that gets old. Um, we're connected to the crew trail. Uh, you go through this ditch here, and there's these kissing gates, they're called, to keep the cattle in. It's a working cattle um, property, and that was an eco cow project. But we got the red trail. So you got your yellow and your green and your white over there at crew, and then we're the red trail, so if you get out there and you get to the red trail, Think of me. <laughs> so why monitor Care Care Pr Prairie Preserve? It's this tiny little 300 acre piece surrounded by district lands and everybody else. Because of this guy or girl. Care <laughs> uh, Care Prairie Preserve is also a <clears throat> panther habitat mitigation area. Um, the county, <coughs> who I work for, um, now I'm part of Conservation Collier, so Chances are we were going to buy this property in anyway. Um, our program acquires and preserves and restores um, conservation land, preserve land in Collier County to tax their payer dollars. Now, before we bought Kara Kara Prairie Preserve, um, we were in talks with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and prior to signing anything said, hey, if we were going to buy this, would we also, we being the county, I say that because even though I'm with Conservation Collier, it's a section within Collier County, but as for using something for mitigation, they look at the whole agency. So I don't build roads, but apparently I kind of help. But that's a whole other story. <laughs> um, so as long as we were going to say, okay, if we buy this property, even with its with even if it's with conservation power dollars, someday we still might use it for mitigation because in order to develop things within panther habitat, you have to mitigate off site um, for lost habitats. And so basically um, opponents were saying, Well that's not fair, you were gonna buy it anyway with conservation power dollars, you should have to mitigate more land, and so there was a debate, and I was not part of that debate, and now I manage the land, so let's, let's just. Um, so here is the land now. Originally we thought it was going to be for roads, but um, a couple years ago, Solid Waste said, oh, we, we need to build a resource recovery park by the landfill for like recycling and things. So there's 38, 34 acres down here. Kara Kara Prairie Preserve is 367 up there. We're going to mitigate for that property. And you're, you're thinking so far away, why? But then if you look at, hold on. 
it's, they're both in primary um, pan for habitat, just kind of <laughs> roundabout. They're both in Collier County, so it was a good fit. And that way, it, it was more fair because we took all the mitigation that was there and we used it all at um, the resource recovery park instead of having to keep track of different um, areas and things like that. So that's that's way too much time spent on that. I apologize. So what are our goals of monitoring at Care Care Prairie? We want to evaluate the success of management activities using established protocols and adjust management activities as necessary to achieve success criteria. Now, this is something, um, as a land manager, I've been managing down here for um, 15 years, and uh, a lot of times the extent of my monitoring has been like photo points of just going out and looking at it. It's like, yeah, we need to do this, yeah, we do this. So this was really interesting for me to do this because it was a requirement. Um, what are, we, what are we assessing? We're assessing native vegetation. So we set up 10 different transects with different plots. We assess the exotic vegetation, actually map it instead of just going out and saying, oh yeah, we gotta do some treatments. And also wildlife utilization. Um, I set up seven camera traps. Originally, there were um, transects for tracking with uh, animal prints, but that was really time consuming and it cost money every time we had to redig the transects. So I switched it over to camera uh, trapping. And with the camera, oh, criteria for success. We wanted, we identified what our goals were. So this, this methodology was based on um, OBVM, which is an uh, FWC way of managing lands, um, objective-based vegetation management. You go out, you have your objectives that you want your, your land to look like, and then you monitor to see if your land management activities are actually creating the kind of different lands that you want. Uh, so what do we want to do? We want to burn the freshwater marshes to make them more open, which I haven't done yet. And it uh, reduced the exotic vegetation to 1%. Torpedo grass was another story. Like I said, there's cattle. They eat torpedo grass. So I said, I can't really get rid of all of it. So we kind of negotiated with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And they said, OK, keep it at baseline conditions, but don't let it go above. And finally, are the listed species and other wildlife still using the preserve like they should be? So for native vegetation monitoring, we, uh, we took uh, the different transects. What I'm going to do is just show a little bit of, uh, we've been doing it for four years now, so we don't have too much data, but the point is to do it the consistent every year to, to see what's going on. So these are the different uh, hammock plots that we had. And you can see, I just grabbed different things. I, I did a hammock one to show you and have marsh and one through the pine flatwoods. You can see the canopy is at 80%. That's about where we want it for a hammock. Sub canopy has been reduced quite a bit. Um, we were able to burn some of it. And you can see the ground cover has increased quite a bit. Dog fennel, although it was up from zero, it's still below 1% and Caesar weed is below 1%. I just got done doing the, the transects for this year. So this is um, from last year's data. But I just want to mention Mark and Jerry. Um, my two very dedicated volunteers. And I don't want them to be offended by this here. This represents, because this year we did, this, we did the monitoring and it's so much lower, it's unbelievable. But what happened was dog fennel was zero. We burned, dog fennel went nuts in uh, this whole area down here, which is part of the transects. And so the fact that it's a 0.25 now, so you're not seeing the in-between years. I'm just showing you what it is. Um, same with Caesar weed. It just <coughs> exploded. So the fact that it's even below baseline is a testament to the hard work. Uh, so here are, uh, we also took photo points. And this is, I love this picture. Um, 2009, pre-burn, it was hammocky. And 2015, this, we just took this one. You can see how much uh, the understory is reduced. And there's so much different herbaceous um, plants on the ground. Uh, this area didn't even burn that well. We had trouble getting fire through that. Um, here's a wetland transect. 
you can see that the ground cover went up to 104. <laughs> um, torpedo brass is still baseline. Now Wright's nut rush in 2014, if anybody knows anything about that, it's, it's affected by the different water levels. And 14, I think, was, uh, it was still around. We were treating it, but the, the seeds remain, even if it's wet, the seeds remain. And then once you get it dry down, it'll come back up. So I'm suspicious. I think it's still going to come back. Here's the difference. Now this is a wet season picture from 2009, and this is a dry season, but you can see, I think this open area, uh, we treated a lot of the nut rush, and then uh, torpedo grass came back, we treated some of the torpedo grass. Finally, this is the, my thought <coughs> and this is where we did a lot of work. We um, reduced the understory mechanically, and then we put a fire through there. So the canopy, which odd, it must just be the transect, it's actually, Higher, but a lot, a lot of the pines are thinner in different areas. Sub canopy has reduced greatly, and the ground cover it um, nearly doubled, which is it's pretty awesome. And because I don't normally do this kind of monitoring, because it takes a lot of time, um, it's really cool to see because it's stuff I would have been doing anyway, and to show that hey, what you're doing is actually what you wanted to do without just going and looking at it. Um, Again, this oh, the Caesar weed thing is a little off. It, it's not like that anymore, and the dog fennel is non-existent pretty much. So, and here's our. You couldn't even crawl through that. <laughs> and then, it's look. It already needs to be burned again. But. So here's our mapping. Um, this is just a quick thing. We we mainly focus on the the marshes. And the red is bad, orange, yellow, that's what we're trying to get away from. And so this is this year's map. You can see it's getting a lot better. Wow. But um, it's going to take a little while. It's tricky. You don't want to nuke the marsh. It's really bad because um, then you kill the good stuff. But we are do trying something new. Uh, I'm going to have, and Mark and Jerry are going to help me again. We're going to, the torpedo grass, even though it's kind of a baseline, I don't want to spray too much. I've noticed that the cattle don't like to eat the sword gra uh, cord grass and the spike, spike grass. So we're going to put some plants in where the thicker torpedo grass is on the map and see if that can maybe just shade out the torpedo grass a little. So wildlife monitoring, uh, this is the camera survey. What I'm, I'm trying to measure here is the relative abundance indices, not really get a population estimate, but see over time what the trend is for the, the different populations out there. Um, and I kind of just wrote, how, and Kathleen helped me with this, because I'd never done this before. So, um, you know, what's a good way just to do it the same way all the time, every year? Um, you take your traps and you count one every half hour if you see something, that's, that's an observation, even if there's multiple um, individuals. This is, uh, so far we've only done it uh, three times. <laughs> and I did it dry season and wet season, and then again the dry season. And this is interesting, the raccoon, I don't know. <laughs> like the first year we did it, there were a ton. I don't know if they had a little, there was one spot, one camera where there were two that kept fighting. So like every hour I'd have two raccoons. <laughs> 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 and same thing, it's like depends. Sometimes they were maybe had a burrow because I see the same armadillo every five hours, so that kind of. Oh, but over time, it should level off. The cool thing was the deer. I mean, I don't know. Again, it's just three years, but in the turkey, they they stay pretty, um, pretty good. And armadillo too, they're down, but again, kept seeing the same one. Same with the possum. So got some photos. Here's a raccoon. <laughs> Raccoon. These, I, oh, that, my graph there, that was the most abundant stuff other than cows. <laughs> cows are most abundant. <laughs> but I'm working with them. <laughs> you got fewer cows every year. Um, oh, I didn't mention this. The whole point of this, too, was to, um, we're looking at prey, panther prey species. Um, so these are pretty good panther prey species, I'd say. And, they're the most abundant at the preserve of the cows, which are also abundant. <laughs> <laughs> so, did 
Is, are you managing for cabbage palm? Because certainly fire is not going to decrease that as a mystery. Oh, I didn't mention that part. And this, I mean, again, I just sometimes do things that I see. Um, what happened, we reduced the vegetation with a mulching machine on the one part we burned. And a lot of pines died. And I wasn't sure if maybe it was because there was so much mulch on the ground and it got in the roots. So, and I noticed that a lot, but I noticed a lot of them died where there were cabbage palms. And there is a, a large cabbage palm population. So on the other corner where we're gonna do the next burn, I, I had somebody go in and cut down all the cabbage palms that were around the big pines. And then we're gonna see how that goes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut off the questions here because we're going into a break. So I'm gonna let folks go that wanna go. If you wanna stay and take questions, we can. Um, but we take a break. We'll be back at um, 10.40. All right? Yeah, we'll be back for a few minutes. As a reminder, restrooms, you can go to your right back to the center, to your left around the way to the <laughs>